Welcome to Video Game Evolution, Observations Over 30 Years, also known as the insane and impossible task of talking about 30 years of game history in 10 to 15 minutes. These are observations, not trends. I am not making predictions on where the industry is going. The video game industry has been in existence for about 30 years. In talking about game evolution, I wanted the largest possible time span. How many game series have survived and evolved over 30 years? A few, but not that many. But there is one that many people may think of, and it's an elephant in the room I need to address. Mario. While I would love to talk about this one, it is just too big with too many nuances to cover in a short talk. Sorry. But we'll still have fun. And there is something fun and educational talking about games that everybody isn't already an expert on. So my plan was to cover these three famous game franchises. Unfortunately, due to time constraints, I will not be able to cover Galaga either. This is how the talk is structured. For each game series, I will cover four titles representing the evolution. To give you a conceptual framework, I think video games break down into these four eras pretty easily and my selection of games follows this pattern. I think these are mostly self-explanatory. However, to clarify the difference between the pixel era and the sprite era, the pixel era is the beginning, where developers were preoccupied with controlling individual pixels due to low resolutions and primitive tools. Pixel art required more imagination by players that it represented something. The sprite era is where developers could work more in terms of characters and objects instead of individual pixels, drawings start to look like actual things. Pac-Man, 1980. This is the only game I assume everybody knows, but here it is as a refresher. Despite its age, there is a lot of hidden beautiful detail work in Pac-Man. Did you know each ghost has a different AI? There are different attack phases for the ghosts. Dynamic music. That woo-woo sound gets faster as you progress through the level. For time, I'll skip ahead. Pac-Mania, 1987. Pac-Man was always a little out in front. They did a platformer called Pac-Land in 1984, a year before Super Mario Bros. Pac-Mania is a 3D isometric version of Pac-Man, a little ahead of the 3D revolution that will come in the 90s. Basically, this is Pac-Man with a 3D perspective and zoomed-in camera. The immediate problem with this is you can no longer see where all the ghosts are and all the dots are. You can also see there are no real breakthroughs in game design. Pac-Man now has a jump ability, but can't jump over the walls. Ghosts can jump too, which nullifies this ability, asking, what's the point? Mazes change like Ms. Pac-Man as you progress. Here comes the jump. Here are some different uh, level themes. See, there are a lot more ghosts now, but you can't see all the ghosts in the level. Now we're going to see a ghost jump when Pac-Man jumps, nullifying the ability. So what did 3D really add? Well, it created a camera problem, reflective of many early 3D games. Pac-Man Arrangement, 1996. In the mid-90s, Namco commissioned remakes of their most famous games. Pac-Man Arrangement was Pac-Man's turn. The game's design and look places it firmly in the sprite era, though it preserved a bird's-eye view perspective, kind of like Pac-Mania. However, they immediately corrected the camera problems by zooming out fully and removing panning. Also unlike Pac-Mania, they did not rely on graphics changes alone. There is heavy use of power-ups to change the game mechanics. The first power-up I want to mention is a new blue ghost that acts like a power pellet. I kid you not, the ghost's name is Kinky. 
If you do not eat Kinky in time, it merges with other ghosts to create super-powered ghosts. The next mechanic is the double arrow dash pads. There is a power-up capsule that clones Pac-Man. A capsule that traps ghosts for a period of time. There are different level themes, too. This level has jump pads. Yes, Pac-Man has a boss. The effort was commendable, but in the end, how effective were the power-up mechanics? Here's a thought exercise. Most people will agree with this statement. It's just not Pac-Man without the power pellets. But how many people will say, it's just not Pac-Man without the double arrow dash pads. I'll also ask, what did the 3D perspective really add? This is my pick for the modern era, Pac-Man Championship Edition. I really liked the design of this game. So the original question was, how do you create a modern and compelling Pac-Man sequel? Unlike previous attempts, this game goes back and embraces the fundamentals. The game emphasizes high score instead of survival. When you eat all the dots on one side of the maze, a fruit appears on the other. When you eat the fruit, the side dynamically reconfigures shape with new dots and new ghosts. This eliminates the need to have levels and presents a continuous gameplay flow. While the game goes to serious effort to capture the original pixel era look, the power of the modern GPU is being harnessed to embellish the game in useful, creative, and surprising ways. Pac-Man and the ghosts emit light. The ghosts have trails. Fruit doesn't disappear when eaten, but slides in the status bars. When you eat a power pellet, the maze color changes to reflect how much power you have left. When you eat a ghost, the camera shakes. The game gets faster as you do better. When you get too close to a ghost, the game slows down, giving you a chance to react. A zoom and radio blur are used to punctuate the situation. You can use a bomb as a last resort defensive maneuver to kick ghosts back into the ghost house. When you look at an old Pac-Man arcade, the maze walls seem to glow. That's an artifact of the CRT screen, and not the game. You don't get that today with LCDs, so they simulate the glow with the GPU effects. Even the countdown text is important. It stretches and pops in the place. The game design is brilliant because it utilizes things that already existed. By tweaking the play balance between Pac-Man and the ghosts, a completely new game emerged while still retaining the essence of the original. This is in contrast to Pac-Man Arrangement, which resorted to inventing new play mechanics. And despite the retro look, the game looks spectacular. And in addition to making the game look attractive, the graphic effects were used to convey useful information as well, which aided the game design. This is in contrast to Pac-Mania, where the 3D camera dictated the game design. Ribotron 2084, 1982. We don't really have famous game designers in the US, but Eugene Jarvis is among the closest that would fit the bill. His games like Defender and Ribotron are considered among the most influential in history. Defender is the only video game to ever be featured on a US stamp. And Jarvis even got a cameo on the NBC sitcom News Radio in an episode praising his work. Ribotron 2084's contribution was distilling down intense gameplay to its purest form. And to help accomplish this, Jarvis invented the two-stick control system, where one stick moves and the other shoots. Ribotron is simple. Save the humans, shoot the robots, survive. And the sound's great, too. Thank <laughs> you.
Save the human. 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 This game is still beloved by hardcore gamers to this day. Smash TV 1990, also created by Eugene Jarvis, is not technically a sequel to Robotron. However, the game is very similar to Robotron in many ways. It can easily be thought of as Robotron brought into the sprite era with a game show theme and two-player co-op. how they just keep on coming. This game is also beloved, and there are debates about whether Robotron or Smash TV is better. Robotron X. This is Robotron brought into the 3D era. This game is almost a cliche of all bad 3D games of the era. We start with a low polygon model transition that takes almost as long to watch as beating level 1 in the original Robotron. The game clearly is Robotron in 3D but immediately we see there is a camera problem. You can't see the entire field. The camera bounces around a lot, making you sick. And when you beat a level, you spin around to make things worse. Then you have to watch the low polygon model transition again. So you've just seen Robotron X. So, we got 3D for no good reason, and we got camera problems. Geometry Wars. This is my pick for the modern era. Geometry Wars is not connected to Robotron or Eugene Jarvis, but it is definitely spiritually related and inspired by Robotron. It has a two-stick control style, and it has intense action. Solid play action, and who would have thought line primitives could look so gorgeous? 
This talk was inspired by an innocent question about current mobile games. Why do all these mobile games look like they were made in the 90s? While it's not true that all mobile games look like this, the vast majority of 2D games look closer to Smash TV than Geometry Wars. Think. Angry Birds. Cut the Rope. Candy Crush. There's no technical reason for this. The modern iPhone and iPad are competitive, if not more powerful, than an Xbox 360. I am going to suggest this is creating a deeper problem. There now seems to be a growing prejudice against 2D games because so many do look like they're from the 90s. If you ask a 2D game developer if their game is 2D or 3D, they automatically feel they need to qualify the answer or defend it. It's 2D, but it's cool in this other way. Or it's actually 2.5D, whatever that means. And I think there is a general lack of imagination in the industry as a whole. There are tons of SIGGRAPH papers focused on 3D rendering techniques harnessing the programmable GPU. But there is little in comparison for 2D, which shares the exact same programmable GPU. 2D is not solved. Thanks to the programmable GPU, there is a whole frontier waiting to be explored. 2D can be just as compelling as 3D. 2D is not something to be embarrassed by and need to be justified or qualified. Why should we care? Well, I care because I want to play better games. We need to stop leading game designers into terrible design decisions dictated by technology because they had to pick 3D because it's deemed cooler. The choice between 2D and 3D should be an artistic design decision, not a technical or marketing decision. I am a co-founder of Lanica. We are building a platform for game developers. I am passionate about enabling people to make better games. I want to unlock the untapped potential of 2D and allow for new game designs and metaphors that would not be possible before. I want to bring a day where you can just say 2D and not need to qualify it with 2.5D or other silly defenses. And I want to enable developers to design and ship better games. Please join us in our journey. I know I'm out of time. If you have any questions, please come and talk to me. Thank you.